This is Peter Helland on the show Israel. The title is Ask for the Old Paths, <clears throat> which is in Jeremiah 6.16. And in the King James, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein? And you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. And the RSV, which it's, is the Catholic Bible, but it says it actually comes from the 1611 King James Version. Uh, it says, Thus says the Lord, <clears throat> Stand by the roads, and look, and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. The old path uh, is delineated a little bit further on, Jeremiah 8. It says, How can you say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors. Because from the least to the greatest, every one is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, when, when it says, Therefore I will give their wives to others, that brings back uh, back when I was a student at Notre Dame. And as we've been talking on the show quite a bit uh, recently about evolution and creation and how Notre Dame, uh, after the Civil War, <clears throat> started using Charles Lyell's uh, textbook, <clears throat> arguing that the earth is old. And John Zahm, one of their most preeminent intellects and formers of the, of the school, that's what he studied his freshman year. And then my freshman year, I had the priest teach geology, and it was pure evolution for the whole year, several days a week. Now, this is Notre Dame and scholars saying, we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us. But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. Goes on and says, therefore I will give their wives to others. Well, it just so happened. My freshman year, I took a class, University of Madison in the summer. My mom and everybody, all, all her friends were in the class. This was a, a fellow that was studying at Oxford University, writing a book in Oxford, England. And he came back for the summer and he lived right next to us. He taught the philosophy class, persuaded everybody that there was no God. It's 1972, or it might have been 71. And I didn't know better. I had B.F. Skinner. I had pure evolution. This guy was the brightest guy to ever come from our town. That was the era of the IQ. Well, you get swept along. Thank God I recovered. Came back to Jesus, you know, with a ferocity because I found out what happens when you go down that path. Believing the earth is old, believing in evolution, buying into B.F. Skinner behavioralistic psychology. Not that I did buy into it, because I got out of it. But how many people do buy into it? And what happened to that professor who was living right next to us that summer? His wife left him and went to another man. Therefore, I will give their wives to others. Now, when I saw that, I thought of what happened to him. Now, I have no idea if that actually was a judgment of God as far as this is it. Therefore, I will give their wives to others. Now, whether God gave his wife to another man, <clears throat> I wouldn't want to think I know about that, but, but that's what I thought. And from what I know, his wife did go to another man. So you never know when God's judgments. Evolution says everything's random. If you believe in God, nothing's random. God is in charge of every little atom, every little molecule. Nothing is random. Everything is ordered by God. Jesus said not a sparrow can fall to the ground without it being ordered by God. So when it says, return to, 
ask for the old path. It, it goes on in Jeremiah, and it, and it says, ask for the uh, law of God. It um, goes on and says, chapter 7, uh, verse 23 in King James, but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, neither inclined their ear, but walked in the, count, in the counsels and in the imaginations of their evil heart, and went backward, not forward. So we live in a country, started by the Puritans. You had, I think you had a state, Connecticut, that said, Here's our law, the Bible. That was their law. They didn't have a million laws with a million books delineating their state law. They said, the Bible's our law. We've come a long way because you have, for 40 years or so, we, you, nobody can even put the Ten Commandments in any government building anywhere in this country. Can't even have the Ten Commandments. Basically, it's an abomination to Americans to have the Ten Commandments. That could torture people if they had to look at it. It's basically what the Supreme Court was kind of saying. Now, when you do stuff like this all the time, every which way, you have both fists in the face of God challenging him to be real. They're acting like they don't believe there is a God because if there is a God and we know what he says, something's going to give. Because the scripture says in James chapter 2, there's only one lawgiver who's able both to save and to destroy. And the Ten Commandments represents his law. And then we have the teachings of Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. So Christ, it's commanded that Christ be honored in every country. It's commanded by God. Kiss the Son, bow down before him, or he will destroy you, it says in Psalm, in Psalm 2, I believe. So we're treading on real dangerous grounds when you abandon any of the laws of God and when you fail to acknowledge God, which we fail to do in the U.S. Constitution. So we're looking at big-time judgment coming down the pike. And... In Jeremiah, it talks about, I will bring uh, the nations from the north um, who will come down, and it's a theme all throughout the Old Testament. I will bring in the foreigner, and he will oppress you. The foreigners will come in and oppress you because you're not sticking to the only lawmaker. There's only one lawmaker. And we're passing laws that are directly in the face of God's law. So we're inviting huge wrath to come upon this nation. Now, can the church escape that? The church is caught up in the middle of it. And God is going to, judgment's going to begin in the house of God first. So God is going to prune his church. He's going to call it out. And he's going to create what it says in Zephaniah. Chapter 3, verse 12. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. And the remnant of Israel shall do no iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. But God has a remnant, and they're going to be like Jesus. Jesus says, Come unto me and learn of me. I am meek and I am gentle. The um, RSV for um, Zephaniah says a humble and lowly people. King James says an afflicted and poor people. And affliction and humility do not come easy. It says Jesus himself learned obedience by the things he suffered. And suffering is, is the theme for the Messiah. St. Paul, who was probably the most learned Jew of them all, as far as righteousness, perfect, Pharisee of the Pharisees, he completely thought that the idea of a suffering Messiah was against Scripture all the way. He went out to kill the Christians, partly be, mainly because th this idea that the Messiah is going to be crucified on a tree and suffer, he thought that was blasphemy. Well, he had a blindness over his mind, blindness over his heart. He did not see that the Scripture was talking that the Messiah would have to suffer. And in some ways, there's a blindness over American Christians, some, because they don't see the suffering part. 
they see the blessing part, but they don't see the suffering part. It takes God's grace. It's a gift to see what we see. It's not something we want to see. And the um, passage that kind of brings that out, you probably would you'd go to Ro uh, Romans chapter 8. It says, um, <clears throat> when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You know, of course they're suffering. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. The cross represents almost pure suffering. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to, to futility. Not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from, the bondage, from its bondage to decay. And obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning with labor pains together until now. Now the King James says, we know that all of creation groaneth in pain. Here it says, has been groaning with labor pains together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. Basically saying, creation groans in pain, and not only just creation, we also groan in pain. Now it doesn't say, it says we also uh, we ourselves also groan, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. And as we get older, the body gets more afflicted because the aging process. When you're younger, the body doesn't suffer as many afflictions generally. But God told Adam, don't eat the fruit off that tree. The day you eat, you'll die. The dying process began the day he ate. And after 930 years, he died. And it's this suffering aspect that's all throughout the New Testament. That scares a lot of people away. When I was working in the jail in the, in the chaplain's office, you had 6,000 men go through the jail, some women, 6,000 every year. And back then, you just had the Gideons working there, and then Father Logan, and then he got cancer, so I took his place, so I'm talking to a lot of men. And some guys could be totally on fire for Christ. And one guy was. I remember, I'm thinking of one guy that was. And he was into more of the prosperity gospel, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, you know, a lot of faith, a lot of optimism. So he was just on fire, you know, God can do everything. Well, county jail, you're there temporarily, then you go off to a prison. So he went to his prison, designated prison. A year later, he comes back and he's totally different. What was it? He wasn't expecting the suffering. It's the suffering he encountered. He was not expecting it. Because the gospel he was believing in minimized the suffering. It caught him off guard. So you have to be able to preach the blessings that God gives you. You know, all the good things that don't cause you to suffer. But then you also have to bring in what God is doing. And what is God doing? Well, he's forming us to become like Christ so that he will have this humble and lowly and afflicted and poor people who are purged like the silver and gold are purged of all its impurities so that we will be humble, we will be sincere. And all the pride, all the envy that's just embedded in all, all throughout us is purged away. And um, Hebrews brings that out, that our relationship is with the Father. 
Hebrews 12. It says, um, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against themselves, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation which is, addresses you as sons? See, that's what, the, that's what he kind of forgot. Have you forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons? My son, this is Hebrews 12.5, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines him whom he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. Now, it's good to read the King James because it's what we're used to, at least America is used to, historically. That's why we have the Catholic Bible, the RSV, taking it from the 1611, which is interesting. But the King James says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? For if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. What we're seeing here is that God, Jeremiah says, return to the old paths. Go back and listen to the word of God. Go back and hearken unto God's voice. For the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you have to go back because God already sees, and God wants to purge out the impurities so that he would have a lowly and humble and sincere people. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pursue peace and holiness, without which no anyone will be able to see the Lord. And we live in a country where we're encouraged to pursue happiness, but we're not encouraged publicly to, to pursue holiness. And without holiness, you can't see the Lord. You can't have purity of heart without holiness. And holiness involves some great uh, detail. And it's those details that we don't want to work out. Um, you could see, somebody was, I was listening to a preacher, you could see a, a big block of silver, and the silver looks pure, but it's not. So you have to burn it down and scrape and scrape and clear it out. And until you can see your reflection really clear in that silver, you, it's, not, it's not pure. You know, there's, we have, you know, God wants to see Christ in us shining forth. But there's so many, there's, there's so much in that process. Like Jesus said, every word you speak will be judged. Every thought is to be taken captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10. That requires great discipline. Every thought, every word is going to come under the scrutiny of Christ. And if, it's not whole, if that thought is not holy, you're going to go through the test again. You failed. If that word is not holy, I guess you're going to go through, you're going to, he's going to hold you back. For, you're going to keep, have to re, keep repeating that class. And we live in a, in a nation that pursues happiness, which translates into pleasure. We pursue the pleasure of sin. We pr actually pursue the things that God says to put to death, and it's in the church. Um, just uh, just this morning, I have the Christian radio on. I had somebody in the car, and they wanted the Christian radio on. I said, okay. And it was a comedy scene. It's some comedian, Christian comedian, which is an oxymoron, um, making mockery of his dad, how his dad would use the word father all the time in his prayer. He's just making mockery of all the Christian things. And you're going, okay. Maybe his dad says the word father too much when he prays. Ham looked upon Noah. Noah was drunk and naked in the tent. He just tell, he goes and tells his brothers, you know, hey, dad's naked and drunk in the tent. He told on his dad. 
exposed them. Noah wakes up, curses Ham. Slave of slaves will you be to your two brothers. Told Shem and Japheth, Ham will be your slave. Put a double curse on him. Slave of slaves. The two brothers walk back and covered. Jesus came into the world. Why? Because his earthly father, Adam, Jesus is called the son of man 90 times in the New Testament, which is often translated son of Adam, son of Adam. So Jesus was fundamentally the son of Adam. He came to cover Adam's sin, which any son would do that. He would cover for his dad's sins, which Shem and Japheth did. And we're to be like Christ. That's why our mission is to be forgiving. Our mission is to pray for people's salvation, is to try the best we can to cover for their sins. Because the mind of Christ is that person is more important than him. Well, if, if he has the mind that people are more important than him, or they're way more important than us. So we have to have the mission of Christ and we have to forgive and we have to pray for their soul. And that works totally against our narcissistic flesh. It works against it. And we have to purge that away. But the process is called suffering. If we suffer with him, we'll rule with him. And the suffering is putting the flesh down. I mean, there's suffering for preaching the gospel. But like St. Uh, I think it was um, St. Francis said, supposedly he said, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. So everything you do is a preaching of the gospel. And the classic case of where suffering and humility come in is St. Paul. St. Paul was, wrote half the New Testament and God told him he was going to have to suffer a lot. I mean, that was already prophesied. And Paul was, was the only one that we know of that was allowed to go right into heaven. Took him right up to heaven. Paul writes, and I knew such a man. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. This is King James. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine inf infirmities. Well, everybody believes this. Is, he's talking about himself, but he didn't want to, he, he wanted to act like it wasn't him, but it was. And then he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure. Some say, unless I become conceited or I get proud, unless I get proud, exalted above measure, because of the abundance of the revelation. So he got the revelation of heaven itself. It's, it, it's beyond, it's hard to even think about. I remember first hearing about that by a nun. A, a nun was telling me when we were like fourth grade, how Paul went into heaven, and I'm going, wow, that's interesting. Uh, and lest I be exalted, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Thorn there means, in the Greek, means more or less a stake, like an impalement stake. And the word buffet means to hit, hit your fist on somebody's ears. That's what I heard. For certainly hitting your fist, and I've heard somebody say, yeah, like in your ears. It was given me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, <laughs> it certainly couldn't have been given to him by Satan, because Satan, everything he does is to get you into more pride and more sin. Twice it says, lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I, tw lest I become proud. Twice it says it in one sentence. To keep me becoming proud, there was given me a stake in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to pound me in the ears. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Jesus is saying to Paul, Paul, I'm not taking it away. I gave you this stake, tore right into your flesh. It's super painful. Because otherwise you're going to get proud because of the revelations. But I don't think it's just Paul. We can get proud over anything. You could have the best bike at age eight. I got, you got a better bike than somebody. You're a better uh, ping pong player than anybody. I mean, you, you can be proud over anything. I'm prettier than that girl, so you think you're better. I, what the human being is capable of being proud over, it's, it's unlimited. So we gravitate to pride by, by, our sin, by nature, sinful nature from the fall. And to keep us from getting proud, because the only people who are going to inherit the earth are the ones that have no pride. The afflicted, the poor, the humble, the lowly, the meek, only, they are the only ones that are going to inherit the new heaven and the new earth. And if you think we're going to get there on our own, it doesn't seem likely. It's God who has to chastise us and discipline us. And we have to be willing to thank him and recognize that these afflictions, these sufferings, are coming from somebody who rules the universe. He rules everything. Nothing can happen unless it goes through, through God. That's what Job learned. Job was hit once, all his children, everything was destroyed. That was because Satan went to God and God gave him permission to do it. And then Satan went back to God and said, well, hit him with bodily afflictions. Make him sick. Make his body just painful. Then he'll curse you. Watch him curse you. Well, God hit him with boils and just tortured him with all kinds of painful things on his body. And Job did not curse God. Satan was thought for sure he did. But his wife did. Job's wife cursed God. She wasn't even the one being afflicted. She, she tried to encourage him. Well, she said he, she was encouraging Job to curse God and die. And what did Job say? He says, oh, foolish woman. Foolish. How could you be that Dumb. Um, how, does, how does he say it? Job is right there uh, before the Psalms. And then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the oldest book in the Bible. It says, ask for the ancient path. Ask for the, the old paths. Well, yeah, here's the oldest book in the Bible. Already in the first chapter, you're getting a lot of wisdom. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? St. Paul knew this inside and out. So Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says then, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, glory in my afflictions, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, Paul said, I, I, he came to the church there in Corinth, he said he came to see if they had power. He said, not your words, I want to see if you have power. Well, the power comes from embracing God, embracing what he puts in our path, the afflictions that come our way. It says uh, in 1 uh, Thessalonians that afflictions are appointed by God, that we're called to that. He, um, <clears throat> 
Therefore, chapter 3, therefore when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Tim Timothy, our brother and God's servant in the gospel of Christ, to establish you in your faith and to exhort you that no one be moved by these afflictions. <clears throat> you yourselves know that this is to be our lot. For when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, as you know. King James brings it out a little bit stronger, like, like it all often does. Um, <clears throat> for we have been that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We are appointed. And what did he and that's Paul. Peter confirmed it. It says by two or three witnesses it let everything be confirmed. Well, Peter comes in and confirms Paul. First Peter chapter two twenty one for even hereunto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Same theme that we had in Zephaniah and in Jeremiah. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. And it goes on, for, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. So Peter is really getting him ready to embrace suffering, the mind of Christ. Arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. <clears throat> for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now we're to consider ourselves dead to sin through our death with Christ on the cross. The death he died, he died to sin, and that's the death we died. We've died to sin. We're, we are to consider ourselves dead to sin. And do not let sin reign over your mortal body. For sin shall not have dominion over us, for we're under grace and not law. But it adds this, that he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. It goes on constantly with this theme. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins first with us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So God uses suffering to sanctify us, to purify us, and to cause us to get serious, to get serious about his teaching. Because otherwise, we're, we're tempted to give him lip service, but not, not our heart. And suffering tends to bring us to that point. And Peter, it closes. It says, be, so, be sober. Talks about pride and humility. The humble person casts his care upon the Lord. And the proud person apparently does not cast his care upon the Lord so well. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, same sufferings, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal, eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So the 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 suffering is part of the mystery. And if you study the life of Charles Darwin, who was instrumental in shifting all of education, or they used Darwin to shift all of education, especially after the Civil War, to make science the premier queen of the sciences. Theology was the queen of the science, and then science became the queen of the science. But Darwin, <clears throat> as the story goes, of course he was raised a Unitarian. He was going to the seminary, and then he went on the ship Beagle, 
and he had already accepted Charles Lyell's idea that the earth was old and he then pictured the world as having a, a, you know, being very old, millions and millions of years. So he already pictured that he's already challenging scripture because scripture says death came into the world through Adam's sin. Well, if the earth is very old with animals and who knows what, humans, then death was already there before the fall. So that's already throwing the Bible for a loop. And then Darwin just added to it. But he started out in the seminary. And I was reading when he first got on the Beagle, he's trying to win souls, evangelize them. First got on that boat. I don't know, it was a four-year voyage. I don't know what it was. And, but then the story goes <clears throat> that his daughter, his oldest daughter, I think it was Emma, age 11, dies, gets sick and dies. And that was it for him. He was already, his wife was a, supposedly a marvelous Christian. But his grandfather was like a deist. I mean, he had Unitarian. I mean, he had some pretty bad stuff in his background as far as unbelief. But when his daughter died, he was so upset, apparently so angry with God, perhaps, that he just couldn't deal with the suffering. Why did she have to suffer? And then he thought the world was old. And then he goes, look at it. God is allowing all these millions of years people are suffering. He can't be a good God. Something is really wrong. So this happens a lot. You come into a bad situation, and how could God be good? How could God be real? How could you just start challenging it? And you have to be ready for that. You have to be ready that, as it says, we are appointed to afflictions. You have to be ready that suffering is up, the, up ahead. You could be 20 years old, probably have, maybe you haven't suffered a thing, basically. But real suffering usually happens to most people because God uses that. If it says that Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered, how about us? And when it says, ask for the old paths, well, we're just saying, get back to the Word of God. Get back to the basics. Our, our nation has fallen way off. Um, the best place to, to go to and start, I like, is Titus. Because it talks about Titus. Paul says to Titus, you need to appoint elders. You need elders that hold fast the faithful word as, as he has been taught and that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And I was just hearing a, a preacher talk about back in Christ's day, the house was everything. The household was everything. Don't forget, because half the... 30-40% of the Roman Empire were slaves. So a household like Abraham oftentimes had many slaves, many children, maybe extended family, and the father ruled over a lot. And the goal of the enemy was to somehow disrupt that, create rebellion somewhere in the ranks to disrupt it. And these, they had many vain talkers, many deceivers, especially they had the circumcision, the Jews. And a lot of people, Martin Luther, Martin Luther himself, the reformer, one of his last books was to warn his flock that the Jews still were out to, to get him. And to subvert whole houses, to, to get the wife not to honor and obey her husband as unto Christ. To get the children not to fear their parents. And he goes into that, and, and then he, Paul says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. First, thing, uh, first verse, chapter 2. At the, the last verse of chapter 2, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man dis despise you. 
So when it says get back to the old paths, go back to Adam. Who was Adam before the fall? He was somebody that God created out of the dust and breathed into him. He said, Adam, take dominion over the whole earth. Rule over it, over the animals, rule over it. That would have included his wife. And he failed to rule over her. He obeyed her instead. And he eats of the tree God commanded him not to eat. And he fell. And now all this suffering, all the curses on the earth is for one reason. This goes against what evolution and Darwin teach. But all the suffering, which Darwin didn't want to process, he blamed God that his daughter died and he was blaming her for everything. No. God told Adam, do not eat the fruit off that tree. The day you eat, you will die. So they're gonna, you're going to blame God for giving that command? Instead of obeying God, he obeyed his wife, who was the weaker vessel. The, ser the serpent pulled her into his camp. And now we have to fight the fight of faith. We have to follow the teachings of Christ. We have to get back to the law of God. And what's it say? Speak the things that become sound doctrine. Real basic, simple stuff. Older men, be sober and grave. Likewise, the older women, be sober and grave. Older women, teach the younger women to love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Is that what Notre Dame's teaching the, the girls at Notre Dame? You are to be a keeper at home. The Greek word is guard that home. You stay at the home and guard it. Is that what they're teaching them? Or are they teaching them to get a career? Um, keepers at home, be good. Be obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Why should you be a keeper at home and obedient to your husband? So that the word of God be not blasphemed. So if you're not obeying your husband and you're not being a keeper at home, you're causing the word of God to be blasphemed. This is, this is the essence of sound doctrine. This is the old path. And what goes along with this in Paul's teaching? Women, have the covering on the head when you worship as a sign that you're, you are under obedience. Are they still wearing the head covering, which they wore for 1960 years? Everywhere of all Christianity, basically? No, they took it off. And in the Catholic Church, they took it off in about a couple weeks. 1965 years, they were all wearing it, and in a couple weeks, 95% of the women were not wearing that head covering. That quick. And what was the reason? There was no reason. They just said, well, you have the option. You can wear it or not wear it. Boom, two weeks, 95%. We don't want to wear it. We don't like it to be a symbol that we're under obedience to the husband. When we don't have to be, why should we be? Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing young corruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech. I'm talking about the young men. Exhort the slaves to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again. Not purloining, not stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So the slaves were commanded, you adorn the doctrine of God by obeying your master as unto Christ. That doesn't fit into American culture too well. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. So these are the things you're supposed to speak and exhort. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. It's not just wives obey husbands, not just children obey your parents, not just slaves obey your masters, not just everybody obey the king and the governors. It also says, which Pete, you don't hear too often actually, Hebrews 13. Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Then it says, obey them, verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. So you're supposed to obey the priest, the pastor, the elder, those who have authority in that church that you belong to or you're part of. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they, must, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Well, how, how well is our obedience 
to the elders in the church. How is that working? How well is our obedience of our wives to husbands? How is that working? Do the husbands command their wives at all? Do the pastors command their flock at all? If they're not leading, if they're not commanding, there's nothing to obey. Well, freedom has overtaken America. We're free from being commanded. Who's being commanded? Is there any, are there elders commanding the flock? Are there husbands commanding their household? Abraham commanded his household, and that is what it says made him approved by God. Partly, I guess. This is suffering. We don't like it. We want to find another way, but to be, become humble and overcome your pride, we have to submit to the cross. But Jesus said, come unto me. My yoke is not hard. Put my, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and gentle. It's the only, it's our only hope. It's the only path of eternal life. And Jesus promises, he says to Paul, he says to all of us, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul, he, he saw it. He said, therefore, most gladly will I rather glory in my weaknesses, in my afflictions, my infirmities, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So we, we, we have to ask God for faith. The one man prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We have to believe that God's grace is sufficient. And then we have to listen to the admonition in Romans chapter 4. He says at the end of chapter 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you're going through an affliction, maybe it's like a thorn in the flesh like Paul, a stake, maybe it's a powerful affliction. Paul prayed three times. He prayed, Jesus prayed three times. He prayed, Lord, get, I, can't, I cannot handle this. I cannot go forward. He pleaded with the Lord, take it away. And amazingly, surprisingly, if anybody knew how to pray, it was Paul. Uh, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So let us therefore, since that's true, since his grace is sufficient for every situation we're in. Hard to believe. Therefore, let's come boldly to the throne of grace. We have a high priest that went into the Holy of Holies with his blood. So through the blood of Christ, we go into the Holy of Holies with Christ. We've been raised up with Christ. We sit with him in the heavenly places. So by faith, we stand in this grace and we can approach God and say, Abba, Father, and receive grace and mercy in the time of need. Because these sufferings and these afflictions that come our way are more than we can handle. It was more than Paul could handle. And God oftentimes removes the affliction. It says the righteous are delivered from their afflictions all the time. But Paul wasn't in that case. And there'll be, there may some, come some times where God will not deliver you from your affliction and instead may say, my grace is sufficient. So we have the hope that he will deliver us from our affliction. But if for our pruning and for our maturing into humility, he may have us come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for grace and mercy so that we could Endure so we can go forward in our Christian life. But a lot of it is to get us into the Word of God, into the teachings, into the law of God, and try to weed out the deception. And I'll close with one of the great, great deceptions. And somebody commented on this. Um, 
I think I have a couple minutes. Somebody commented about uh, jesting. And jesting is one of these, these sins that's condemned by Paul, but it's a virtue in our culture. And I was reading from the great uh, Bishop Bosway, and he was talking about Thomas Aquinas. And let me read this quick. And to make it one's constant business and trade, as it were, to promote laughing is exceedingly faulty and altogether unsuitable to the dignity of men or Christians. St. Thomas, who attended but little to the propriety of the Greek text, could not make this reflection upon St. Paul's manner of expressing himself. But it did not escape St. Chrysostom, who had the skill to observe that the word eutropelos does properly signify a man of art and address, which means one who can with great ease turn himself into different forms and humors, which agrees with Aristotle's account and etymology of the word. Only Chrysostom and the philosopher Aristotle differ in this, that Aristotle takes it in a good sense, as, as it implies agreeableness of conversation, readiness of wit, gaiety of humor, and is opposed to the blunt rudeness and ribaldry of fools and clowns. Whereas St. Chrysostom keeps his eye chiefly upon that part of the signification, which implies the levity and inconstancy of the person, the meanness of turning mimic, and affecting to make the company laugh all which Christostom looks upon as qualities much too trifling and airy for the gravity of a Christian, who has such important concerns upon his hands and beneath whose character it is to descend to such little and despicable artifices and designs. And just, I added, John Wesley had rule number two for his ministers. Rule number two, be serious. Let your motto be holiness to the Lord. Avoid all lightness, jesting, and foolish talking. See, this brings it down to every thought and every word. And you've got to know what the word means. That may mean you need to know the Greek. So, this is Peter Helland on the show Israel.